we have studio spaces because I have always felt that it's important for people to find the thing they want to make and not feel like they have to invest in a lot of stuff to do it. So by having studio space and having sewing machines and cutting tables um, and all the different uh, tools that you need, um, you don't have to make that big investment. You don't have to have a lot of space um, and it allows you to create with others as well. So it has always been part of our like bigger picture plan for the store to have um, the space available. So currently, just even this afternoon, we have two workshops happening. Um, one is uh, using raffia to knit and the other is a quilt making class. Um, and that's pretty much what happens here every single day. I primarily teach garment sewing classes, everything from garment sewing techniques, like how to alter a pattern, how to alter existing clothes, how to put in things like invisible zippers and buttonholes, um, as well as um, how to like take a pattern from a garment. I grew up um, sewing clothes, so it's something that I have a deep passion in and something that I find a lot of joy in doing and sharing. And are you finding there is increasing interest in people wanting the skills? So one of the things that I noticed right away after opening Gather Here 11 years ago was that we could not offer enough workshops. We could not have enough classes on just sewing. Our most popular class is actually Sewing Basics, where you're learning to operate a sewing machine, how to accurately cut, and how to sew, knowing things like what is a seam allowance, how to press correctly, and then, you know, that class leads to learning how to make all kinds of different things. Um, and people want to take that class so much that we offer it every single week. Mm, and what are the age of the people who are coming along? Um, our demographic ranges from we teach kids how to sew, they are eight to 15 years old, as well as adults. And they are all over the place, like kids um, in high school who um, are looking for a creative outlet outside of the classroom, college age students. We have a lot of graduate students, um, people doing postdoc work who come to gather here looking for a hobby, a, a thing um, to put energy into that produces a physical thing. Um, and then we have retirees um, and professionals, so anywhere from the ages of 16 to 75. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's definitely impressive. Um, yeah, well done on that. <laughs> so um, what do you think is attracting people? I mean, obviously there are varying reasons. Can you outline some of them? I think one of the reasons people gravitate to making things with their hands is this age we live in where we're often online or even the work we produce may not seem very tangible because it ends up on the cloud or it's part of a larger project. And when you hem your own pants, you have instant gratification. You have made something that's wearable, that you feel a sense of accomplishment in, um, and it's incredibly tactile. So when somebody learns to make a tote bag, they make a physical bag that they then can carry things in and that can lead to exploring other things you might want to make. Um, there has also been a lot of interest in kind of pushing against fast fashion. So even in a class that we offer, which is um, just basic alterations, people are finding clothes deep in their closets or at a local thrift store and they want to know, how do I make this something that I want to wear? And we talk about like what drew you to the garment? Was it the fabric? Was it partially the fit and the style? And then what about it makes it that you're not wearing it now? Um, how can we give it new life? And it's like a really fascinating process because people then really have to think about their consumption. And when you learn to sew, suddenly you infuse value into the thing that you've made. 
And when you suddenly value the labor, it also makes you a more conscious consumer. Mm, and you're more attached to it then, you look after it. Yes, mm. yes, and that's the number one question we get after like a knitting class. Someone knits their first sweater, they wanna know how do I make sure the sweater lasts forever? Um, how do I care for this thing, which perhaps when you spent you know, $4.99 in the sales section, you weren't so concerned about how you extend the life of the of the garment. Mm. And I mean, when you make things, you also understand the skill involved. Um, how do you find people like, can everybody follow it through? Or do you, you know, how do you get the satisfaction on what is a reasonable investment that has to be made in the materials to get a good outcome? So something that I stress in my sewing classes is that it's process over perfection. And that's sometimes very difficult for people to let go of this idea that you're going to learn something and immediately be good at it. I mean, especially in the United States, there is this idea that we go to school, we are supposed to get good grades and with good grades, you get a good job and that you're good at these things. And it's hard if you're already good at everything in your life, when you're learning something new, if you struggle with the fact that you might make mistakes, you will probably make mistakes, it becomes very difficult to make it to the next step. And I tell people all the time what we're making when we make our first dress or our first pair of pajama pants is you're not making something that goes into an art gallery. You will never be standing so still that someone will be able to tell that your um, top stitching is an eighth of an inch off. What you are doing is creating something for a three-dimensional figure that will be in movement. And that then allows wiggle room and you can embrace those imperfections. And those imperfections then once again make this thing that you've created incredibly unique and unique to you. What about the uh, the emotional um, benefits that might come from working together and gathering together, working with your hands? Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? The, the actual, how the process benefits us? One of the things that we noticed specifically during the height of the pandemic here, um, in March, 2020, we had to close our store to all in-person shopping and learning. And so many people reached out wanting to find a way to continue connecting and making in a group setting. And we had to very quickly learn to teach online and learn to offer all of the elements of a workshop or creative sharing environment through the lens of iPhones and computer screens. Um, but people needed that connection. They didn't just want to watch a video of one of us explaining the steps. They wanted the actual in-person, even through a computer screen, connection of learning and sharing and holding up their work, um, getting feedback, talking about the fabric they chose, talking about the fit of something. And that connection, I think, especially during the pandemic, was so important as to people who maybe were only working from home or maybe didn't even have roommates, didn't have other people to check in and share with. Um, and there's an element of celebration when we finish something. So in that classroom setting, even though it was online, when we completed something, we could share in that accomplishment altogether. Um, and it was a really rewarding experience for me. Um, somebody who loves sewing would is happy to sew alone, but especially during the pandemic, found a community of people that I knew existed because they shop at the store, they've taken other classes, but were people that um, I saw weekly um, and helped me manage the passing of time and the stress of the unknown. Um, can you tell us a little about your own wardrobe? You look gorgeous today, <laughs> very bright. Um, what's going on there for you? I love to sew. I have always loved sewing and I've always loved color and pattern. Um, I am a costume designer for film and television, actually. Um, it's something that I do 
pretty full time uh, as well as own the store. And I get asked frequently by producers or other crew members um, if I always dress brightly and in big bold patterns and I do. Um, it's a way for me as a Filipina American woman in a primarily uh, woman uh, focused field, sewing, costuming, um, to take up space. Um, I want people to recognize me as an expert in color and texture um, and um, hear me when I share my thoughts on character and how people dress. Um, I, I don't want to be a wallflower. And so I make very um, conscious choices about what I'm wearing and what I make. Um, I do wear a lot of natural fibers. It's something that's incredibly important to me. Um, I want what I make to last a very long time. So I do take time and care and focus a lot on the craft itself so that the things I make will last with me um, and be part of me for as long as possible. So I sew a lot in cotton um, and linen and fabrics like that. Um, and I do have some silhouettes that I'm really comfortable with. So dress number one by Sonia Philip, uh, 100 Acts of Sewing is a go-to pattern for me. I switch up the length, I switch up my neckline. Um, I always have pockets. Um, I like functional clothing um, that is comfortable, but is also like bold and makes a statement. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm sure you, well, as you said, you hold on to them for a long time. So I'm wondering if you can contrast that with the current way that most people buy clothes, which is off, you know, just in the shop and through fast fashion and that kind of thing. Like what's wrong with that? Um, so I think there is such this idea that we need to dress with whatever is in fashion in the moment and what makes that affordable um, without thinking about what the long term affordability of shopping like that actually has not just on ourselves, but on our planet and the community and the people who are making these things that can cost so little and have literally fall apart. Um, you know, I had a, a friend who had bought a skirt that had buttons all the way down the center front. And by the end of the day, every single button had fallen off and we just were stitching on the buttons throughout the day so that her skirt would stay closed. And, you know, she had purchased that skirt on a Sunday at the mall. And on that Monday, it was already literally falling apart. Um, and she was like, well, I didn't spend very much on it and probably wouldn't have sewn the buttons back on if it hadn't meant that she was going to be naked <laughs> if she didn't. So there's like this idea that, oh, I didn't spend very much on it. It's not worth the effort to keep it or repair it. And that's something that I am always pushing against, even as a costume designer, where sometimes I have characters that need to be of the moment, that need to look fashionable. Um, or I have a very set budget, but we make a point of trying to still shop as sustainably as possible um, and do things that will not date a film um, in the projects that I'm working on either because we don't always want it to be just in this contemporary moment because you have no idea when something might actually be viewed. Mm. And what do you think, um, uh, from an industry perspective, can change around, you know, what can brands and government and councils do to alter the direction of the es continuing escalation of fashion garments? I think that recently there has been a push to at least make sure that the textiles being used are in some way certified sustainable. Um, how, what that certification process is like, I would like that to be a little more transparent so that they're not just greenwashing the textiles, that people really know and understand what the climate effect of the textile is. Um, just recently um, in California, they are now 
uh, have changed how garment workers are paid. So they're not paid by the piece, but they're literally going to be paid a bare minimum wage, but are being paid hourly. And so as things cost more, I hope that people will pay more attention to what they're buying and how much they need. Um, I think it's important also to have these very honest conversations about fashion and consumption with our friends and our families. I think that it's so easy to make these decisions in isolation. But what I love about having a community at Gather Here is that we talk about the cost of consumption and what we're buying and how we wear it every single day. When people like want to talk about the studio space and why we want you to use a sewing machine in a studio before purchasing one that may you may think, oh, I can easily buy an inexpensive machine at Target or Walmart or some big box store. We counter that with, why don't you use one of our machines and not spend that money until you know that this is a craft that you want to pursue so that you don't end up with some hunk of plastic that's taking up space that you eventually just donate or put on the sidewalk and that collects dust and has once again an effect on the environment just in its manufacture let alone its disposal so we are constantly trying to bring awareness to what it means to own the equipment, make the things, um, alter things. And, um, you know, we last year put out a little free craft library outside of the shop so that people could be leaving and donating their craft supplies, giving them a second life because we feel so strongly that we don't want these things to end up in landfills. Mm -hmm. Just returning back to the the emotional um, and the, you know the personal well-being benefits of making in terms of perhaps calming a lot of people have been talking about the fact that you know it's it's relaxing they you know their mind um, you know comes back after after a big day so can you talk a little bit more about that? I actually yesterday um, took the time carved out time to just embroider a little strawberry patch, just a two by two circular patch that then I went and marrowed the edge so that I actually had a little patch to put on my jacket. And I did that because I was feeling incredibly overwhelmed by the news in the world. Um, in this particular moment of time in the States, um, we're continuing to um, discuss without policy change gun control. And sometimes it feels very impossible to bring about positive change. But carving out time to make something with my hands, share that with my colleagues, allowed me to feel empowered just through the act of making to continue making phone calls, writing letters, having difficult conversations with people about assault weapons in the United States and it's so important that we find the joy in craft so that we can do the harder things. 